She's a princess through and through. She is more girly than her mom. Yana. I believe it. I straight up believe it. So thank you, God. Awesome. That's funny. Morning. Morning. trying to hide but it's not working you always you gotta slip around the corner that's what Anita does she sits in there nobody will say Anita Chris used to put roaches on her on the keyboard and stuff like yeah all kinds of stuff it's great it's fantastic we gotta bring that tradition back gotta bring it back Take her iPad, change that, change the setting to like a bug that pops up. She didn't. Yeah. Oh, Michael, you 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 need to. Yes. Do it. Morning. Good morning. Do, do it, do it. But make sure if you do it, make sure I'm there. Okay. Do you hear what he's gonna do? You know the selfie thing where it puts the bug on you. Morning. That, that would be fantastic. Look, it started out that tall. I'm just Good morning, church. Happy Sunday and welcome All to All right. Get We're started. so glad that you're here. Service is about morning. to start, so we encourage morning. you to go on in and get settled Good morning. because we don't want you to Good. miss a thing. Our mission focus for the month of August is on the missionaries that Hillside helps to support. We regularly send financial support to these missionaries who are local, domestic, and international. And many of them began their faith journey right here at Hillside. Some of these missionaries serve in areas that are not yeah, accepting of it. and even hostile towards Christians. Yeah, so for that reason, to protect their security, their safety, and their ministry, we will only share a little bit of information about some It's a new year, they just decided. Meet Courtney. Courtney serves in Puebla, Mexico at El Pozo, a campus outreach ministry that reaches thousands of college students like in the, Mexico. Like the guy in the Courtney has been serving and living in Mexico in pocket, for 16 like years, since 2007, and is married with three beautiful wow. children. She began attending Hillside in the seventh grade, and continued through the end of high school That's until crisp. going off to college and later moving to Mexico to serve. Her campus outreach ministry focuses on providing a Christ-centered community where any college student will yeah. feel welcomed, loved, and have the opportunity to hear about God in a way that yeah, is relevant lot. to their lives. Very, their mission is clear. to love students, know Jesus, and change the world. This week, please pray for Courtney. Pray for her family <laughs> and for the ministry of El Pozo and Pray the community them. of Puebla, Mexico. I can tell you as someone who was a Hillside missionary, they, the connection forget, uh, and encouragement from people who are praying for you is priceless. Oh yeah, there's no choir. If you would like to get connected to Courtney, please reach out to okay. us at missions like, at hillsideumc.org. Well, good morning and welcome to Hillside Church. It is great to see you today. This is the day the Lord has made and we're gonna rejoice and we will be glad in it. It is so great to see you today. My name is Michael Cromwell and I have the joy of serving as the associate pastor and we are so delighted that you are here today. I wanna invite you, if you're able, as we begin in worship to stand as we join together in our opening hymn. It's hymn number 34, All Creatures of Our God and King. And we'll sing verses one, two, three, and five together. Let's sing together. Thank you. 
be seated. Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to Hillside. We're honored that you're with us this morning. We have a couple of announcements for you as we move through worship today, but before we actually get to those, um, we uh, want to make sure that you actually were able to pick up one of our info bulletins uh, that we've started actually this week. These are going to change about every uh, two weeks, I believe it is, uh, and you'll have different information on these every every two weeks. So, and uh, it also has a way for you to check and see what else is coming out on the calendar there. So I'd encourage you to grab one of these as you leave today if you didn't already grab one. So that's our first kind of semi-announcement. The second one is I want to remind you about our attendance pads. Um, they're right next to you on this side. And if, if you would do us the honor of actually taking those guys and signing in and then passing that down and back, that would be super helpful uh, for us as we move through worship today. Now, our first announcement is for the ladies of the house. There is a, wait a minute. I was about to do a different announcement than that, but that's okay, we'll go that. Still, there you go. Women's retreat, there you go. There's a women's retreat coming up. Uh, and you know, guys, we've been stealing the thunder for so long. We've had the men's retreat every year for like what seems like ever, and now the women's ministry has actually got a retreat coming up, and they're super excited about that. And if you want more information about that, it's hillsidegmc.org slash women, and it's October 18th through the 20th. It's a going away retreat, right? So 18th through the 20th. So write that down, and again, uh, women of Hillside, it's hillsidegmc.org slash women's for that uh, retreat information. And then also, another announcement for the ladies of the house, there's a ladies breakfast coming up, uh, and that is actually coming up. It's Taste and See Saturdays, uh, and that is coming up uh, on August the 17th, and you can find more information about that and even saving your spot for that by going to the website as well. And then we have one final announcement, uh, and that is for those of you who have considered making this your church home, we have a class for you that actually is starting on August the 11th called Starting Point. Uh, and it's a two-class series. It happens right after this service, and it's about an hour and 15 minutes long. So if you have considered making this your church home, we'd love for you to register for that. I think I've got five to six spots still remaining for that. So if you're interested, love to have you do that. So with all that said, these are our announcements uh, for this Sunday. So let's take a moment and prepare hearts for worship. Amen. Thank you, Benita. I invite you to hear these words from Psalm 63 as our call to worship this morning. 
Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. So my lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. So I invite you once again to stand as we join together in our next hymn, hymn number 130, Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us. shepherd lead us much we need thy tender care in thy pleasant pastures feed us for our use thy faults prepare blessed jesus blessed jesus thou hast brought us thine we are blessed jesus Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy face. Before you take your seat, I invite you to turn and greet one another now in the name and love of Christ.
Thank you, Karen, for blessing us. Anita, where have you been? <laughs> Good morning, church. You are a sight for sore eyes. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A word of gratitude for, for you um, allowing me to step away for a little while. We've been through a challenging season over the last three or four years, and I just needed a, a little respite to let my brain rest, my heart open up to the Lord and uh, listen to his voice speaking. So thank you for that grace given me. Would you bow with me as we pray? Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, fall afresh on all of us this day. By the power of your word and the mystery of your grace, change us into the people that you have created and are calling us to be. We pray this in the name of the one we call the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Certain things bring out the worst in people. Today, I have a word for it. They call it triggering. For some, it's uh, bad drivers. Like when you see someone driving at or below the speed limit in the left-hand lane <laughs> and you feel what is almost a visceral response to tailgate them and to come up on them and just wave hi in the rearview mirror. For others, it, it might be drinking alcohol to excess, which we know significantly alters our brain function, our judgments, our reflexes, and yes, even in many cases, our behavior. For still others, believe it or not, I found this out, it is travel that brings out the worst in people. How many of you have ever been on a flight with someone who won't stop talking? Even though you've pulled out your Kindle, and made it perfectly clear or put your headphones in, your earbuds in, and stuck it into the seat back in front of you that you're not interested in talking or listening. That sounds rather mild, 
But what if the person sitting next to you starts to clip their toenails? <laughs> or that mother sticks a dirty diaper in the seat back pocket? Believe it or not, that stuff happens. It happens so often, in fact, that several flight attendants, tired of having to tell people, please don't do that, started using their smartphones to snap pictures of the world's worst offenders and post them to their own website. And the name of the website says all you need to know, passengershaming.com. It's a real deal. And since connecting that that website to major social media platforms, the site also allows any passenger to become an official photographer. The pictures themselves, if you go on, kind of PG a little bit here, uh, are quite astounding. There's one picture of a pile of newspapers and other trash that a passenger left behind. There's the picture of the male passenger sleeping without a shirt on. And many of the pictures are of bare feet, toes from the passenger in the row behind, sticking through the gap between the seats, <laughs> feet in a seat back pocket. And there's even a picture of a woman who appears to be giving herself a pedicure. The website exists to discourage such behavior, to deter bad behavior by showing the perpetrators how grossly obnoxious they are. And yet, in spite of all those pictures, some people just aren't getting the message. Which doesn't surprise me, because most human beings are quick to recognize bad behavior in others before seeing it in themselves. Even the best of us can be blind to our own bad behavior. And sometimes we need an official photographer to point out our failures. In my opinion, the most famous of official photographers in the Bible was a man named Nathan. The biblical history of Israel's monarchy is peppered with prophets who would advise, who would support, even rebuke or scold the nation's leaders. Now, most prophets in the Old Testament did not have their own books like Elijah, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. Rather, they appeared as antagonistic characters. According to Joel, Bag Joel Baden, nudging Israel's history in one direction or another. Nathan is one of those type of prophets. What's significant about Nathan is that he delivers two of the most famous prophetic speeches in the history of Israel's kings. The first is located in 2 Samuel chapter 7, when David expresses his desire to build a house for God, which would have been the first temple. Nathan tells David, no, you won't build it. But he promises that David will build an everlasting royal house that is a dynasty and proclaims that David's yet, as of yet to be born son, Solomon, will be the one to build the temple. Nathan gives his second greatest speech a few chapters later, in response to David, having an illicit relationship with Bathsheba and having her husband Uriah killed in battle, God, according to Scripture, is furious with David for the adultery he committed and the murder he arranged to cover that up. So God sends Nathan to deliver a message from God in the form of what is considered the most famous parable in the Hebrew Bible. And this is what Nathan said, found in 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. And God sent Nathan the prophet to tell this story to David. A rich man and a poor man lived in the same town. The rich man owned a lot of sheep and cattle. But the poor man had only one little lamb that he had bought and raised. The lamb became a pet for him and for his family. He even let it eat from his plate and drink from his cup and sleep on his lap. The lamb was like one of his own children. One day, someone came to visit the rich man. But the rich man didn't want to kill any of his own sheep or cattle and serve it to the visitor. So he stole the poor man's lamb and served it instead. 
David was furious with the rich man and said to Nathan, I swear by the living God that the man who did this deserves to die. And because he didn't have pity on the poor man, he will have to pay four times what the lamb was worth. Then, da then Nathan told David, you are that rich man. Now listen to what the Lord God of Israel says to you. I chose you to be the king of Israel. I kept you safe from Saul and even gave you his house and his wives. I let you rule Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much more. Why did you disobey me and do such a terrible thing? You murdered Uriah the Hittite by letting the Ammonites kill him so you could take his wife because you wouldn't obey me and took Uriah's wife for yourself, your family will never live in peace. Someone from your own family will cause you a lot of trouble, and I will take your wives and give them to another man before your very eyes. What you did was in secret, but I will do this in the open for everyone in Israel to see. And David said, I have disobeyed the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Whenever I read this story, I can almost see David on the edge of his seat, his blood beginning to boil, and you get the sense that he is ready to carry out the judgment of justice himself. His reaction is a bit over the top. He, he says the perpetrator deserves to die for his crime. He even comes up with what he believes is a just and appropriate settlement. The rich man, he says, to compensate the poor man with four lambs in exchange for the one that he took. King David, who abused his power when using Bathsheba for his selfish purposes, and then conspired to have her husband's murder look like a battlefield death, is now acting the way one would expect, one would hope a king of Israel to act. Now, all of a sudden, he's ready to defend the little guy, to stand up for the poor and dispense punishment against the abusive tyrant. And that's when Nathan swings the hammer, lowers the boom, as they say. And in the original language, it's written, you are the man. If you've read the story, you, you don't need Nathan to explain it. The parallels between the rich man taking the lamb from the poor man and how David manipulated Bathsheba and Uriah for his own selfish purposes are quite obvious. Everyone sees it. Everyone except David. But how can that be? I mean, God has been with him since he was a child. God was with him as he shepherded his father's flocks. God was with him when he stood on the battlefield facing Goliath. In fact, he was deemed in 1 Samuel as a man after God's own heart. So what happened? How could he not see? Now, before we point the finger at David for his lack of awareness and understanding, let's remember the pictures of bad behavior on PassengerShaming.com. Many, maybe even all of us, have at one time or another said things or behaved in ways that we did not see as an immediate problem to the people around us. For example, how many of us have allowed ourselves to be frustrated or even angered by distracted drivers? I'll admit to it. Yet we too can get distracted by some social media app for a moment or two, even while sitting across the table from someone we claim to be important to us. But bad behavior can get more worse and more serious than that. We all know and we've all seen institutions like banks or major corporations cut ethical corners in their accounting practices to make another quarter of a percent on their balance sheet without thinking about the risk it places on the folks who have invested their money, their life savings in that company or in that institution. We've seen how some folks in government say whatever they think will make themselves look good and make them more popular if 
only to yield another vote at the risk of violating the public trust. In many ways, we do the same thing when we uh, embellish a post on our Facebook page or a social media platform if it gets us more likes. And when we finally see our own hypocrisy, it can be frustrating. Like when we're venting to a friend about someone we think is a gossiper, and suddenly we realize we're gossiping about the gossiper. <laughs> or that moment when we realize we're being judgmental about the person we claim is judgmental. We're so good at seeing the bad behavior of others and missing it in ourselves. It's that dilemma we face that the great Alexander Solzhenitsyn wrote about in that epic, The Gulag Archipelago. He wrote this. If only there were evil people somehow, somewhere, insidiously committing evil deeds. And it were only necessary to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? One and the same human being is at various ages, under various circumstances, a totally different human being. At times he is close to being a devil, at times to sainthood. But his name doesn't change. And to that name we ascribe the whole lot, good and evil. What's ironic, if you think about it, is, and this is key, that we miss seeing not just our bad behavior, but we are also blind to the blessings of God. For example, or more so, when we are blind to God's blessings, we are more prone to bad behavior. Remember, the story of David's affair with Bathsheba is not a Hollywood scripted rom-com like the proposal. No, the, the David and Bathsheba story is a story about power and corruption and sin. It's a story about a man thinking he can take whatever he wants without consequences. Nathan reminds David that it was God who made him king. It was God who protected him from Saul, who conspired to murder David. And it was God who blessed him with, namely, wives and children in accordance with what the cultural standards were of the day. But in that moment that David spotted Bathsheba, he wasn't thinking about being incredibly blessed by God, was he? All he saw was someone he wanted and didn't have. And he put everything that God gave him at risk. And while we may not have the big houses, the, the castles and expensive cars and celebrities and royalty, would risking the loss of what God has given you be any less devastating? In this morning's scripture, Nathan is the voice of God. But more importantly, Nathan's word conveys the authority behind and within the voice of God. Now, the word authority and the word authentic share the same Latin root word, octocritas. And that word translated within the context of Roman culture, Latin culture, means that which allows growth and life. In other words, the authority contained in God's word is intended to support growth and life. In his book, Up With Authority, Victor Lee Austin uses the analogy of an orchestra to explain why we need authority. Orchestras need conductors. 
Because the musicians don't have a single right answer to the question, questions like, what should we play at the concert? Or what should we practice today? Or how should we interpret this passage? Each musician might have a perfectly reasonable opinion, but their opinions will inevitably be different. And that's not good for each musician to do what is right in his or her own ears. If the musicians want to perform music rather than just make noise, somebody has to have authority to decide. <laughs> in the words of Victor Lee Austin, the conductor's authority yields, yields a greater degree of human flourishing than when we would have from musicians playing separately or individually. And my friends, what is true for orchestras is true for human life in general. Amen. In a world where, no, where many no longer believe in absolute truth, that there is absolute, there, there is absolute right or wrong, where not everyone believes that we are sinful, that we are fallen creatures in need of redemption and salvation, everyone will do whatever makes them feel good whatever is right in their own eyes, to quote scripture. And the consequences of such behavior, we know, as history testifies, will destroy civilizations and empires. We need, my sisters and brothers, we need the authority of God's word in our lives. We need the authority to lead us we need the authority to guide us. We need the authority to conduct us. If we are going to flourish and live lives of faithfulness and blessing. And yet, yielding to the authority of God is never easy. Jesus taught his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Taking up the cross meant letting your self-serving obsessions die. John Wesley called it sanctification. This lifelong process of denying yourself, those bits of yourself that can get you into trouble to become more and more like Jesus. Ask any world-class athlete any world-class musician, anyone who does something they're passionate about with excellence, how they got to be where they are. And you'll discover that their pursuit of excellence, their pursuit of a gold medal or a championship ring is the authority in their lives. They carry the weight of what it takes to be at that level. That's why serious followers of Christ commit themselves to practices and habits that strengthen our sense of understanding and the authority of God in our own lives. For example, the practice of personal and corporate worship that we gather every single week. The practice of studying God's Word, whether as a personal daily devotional or part of a Sunday school class or a Bible study group or a life group. The practice of tithing that is giving financially in proportion to your income. The practice of service, offering your talent, your gift, your skill, your passion to benefit someone else, to give yourself to a cause larger than yourself. See, all these practices understood within the context of, our, of who we are as created beings in need of redemption are not meant to be burdens. In Wesleyan language, they are a means to help you live a life of joyful obedience through the authority of God. Those of you who are students in here today, how would... How would this school year be different if you gave God's word the highest, the place of highest authority in your life? How would it change your marriage, your parenting, your friendship, if your friendships, if you gave 
God's authority the highest place in your life? How would it change your work? How would it change the place you work, the people you work with? How would it change how you relate to the poor, to the stranger, to the people who are not like you? Ask the question. This morning we celebrate Holy Communion. The church's primary sacraments, Holy Communion and Baptism, remind us of one thing, that we are not free to do whatever we want to do. That's why before Jesus started his ministry, he submitted to baptism at the hands of his cousin John. And as he ended his earthly ministry, he prayed this prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Because the truth is, my dear friends, we are most free. We are most free when we are under the authority of God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us take a moment for silent confession. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with you people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself for us, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, and he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat, for this is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. 
Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Repeat after me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The body of Christ. Amen. The blood of Christ. Amen. Let me invite those who are coming to serve communion this morning to make their way and prepare themselves, and as they do, let me invite you to the table and remind you that we practice open table. If you're here and uh, you're, you're deeply aware that you've not been the man or the woman that God has called you to be, then you're most welcome to come and receive uh, the, the sacrament. We serve by intinction, which means that our servers will put a piece of the host uh, wafer in your hand and invite you to dip it into the chalice uh, before you take it. Uh, remember also that as you come, there's a basket in the center aisle to receive your offerings this morning and also baskets at the exits as you leave today to provide your tithe, your gift, your offering. If you need um, gluten-free elements, they're located right here. All you need to do is to motion or to refer to Michael or myself and be glad to serve you um, with, with those elements as well. Always remember that our altar rails, our prayer rails are open for you, uh, for your purposes and for God to conduct God's business with you. I want you to come.
now with the confidence of God's children, let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. As we close our service this morning, I invite you to stand once again as we sing together hymn number 558, Marvelous Grace of Our Loving Lord. sound like you're singing to church. <laughs> That's what I like right there. That is church right there. Thank you so much for being here today. Before I pronounce the benediction, uh, we're going to be handing out these 40-day prayer guides. Many of you know that we've been on quite an epic journey over the last three to four years, and uh, we are members of the Global Methodist Church. Our first convening annual, actually general conference, is in September. It's 40 days away. And so we're handing out these 40-day prayer guides, and I want to invite you personally to be a part of that, to be pray praying for. We're going to have delegates from all over the world, from 
uh, the United States, from Asia, from Africa, from uh, Latin America and other places around the world. This will be our first time that we've gathered in Costa Rica, uh, fittingly as a global church that we placed it there, our first one out. And so I invite you to be in prayer for that. We are praying for a revival, a reawakening of our Wesleyan heritage, our Wesleyan family, and I want you all to be a part of that. So as you leave today, the they've got uh, some prayer guides for you. Please take one, put it on your refrigerator, stick it in your Bible, uh, use it as a way of guiding your prayer life uh, over the next 40 days, and we would all appreciate it. Now receive this benediction. Let your love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Give generously to the needs of the saints. Offer hospitality to strangers. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer, for God is with us and God goes with us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace and be at peace, my friends. Amen. Amen. Amen.